Anyway, this is, this is water, so <laughs> I'm delighted to be uh, uh, back here at the University of, of Bath and to have the chance to see colleagues and to engage with all of you at this, this very um, challenging era, very challenging time that we're, that we're in. Thank you very much for the kind introduction since, as he pointed out, that since I was here last spring, the world has been upended by a political revolution, or so it seems. Brexit shocked elites and pollsters in Germany. The AfD, the, the alternative for Deutschland, uh, beat Angela Merkel in her home state. Marine Le Pen um, has been st still polling strong. A full 46% of Austrian voters came out, came out to support a candidate with fascist leanings that would be Hofer on, on the right. Um, and most stunning of all, the world superpower elected a reality TV star um, with no public service experience whatsoever, but with a record of fraud and significant business failures, a tabloid tycoon whose signature talent seems to be selling one thing, fear of immigrants, Muslims, elites, the media. Donald Trump is now leader of the free world. Very few of us saw this all coming. American polit political scientists and pollsters were almost universally wrong in dismissing uh, Trumpism. By contrast, many East Europeans and those with extensive experience in the region were not at all so confident that Hillary Clinton would win and Trump would lose. They had seen this narrative before. I myself I was a social and political anthropologist in communist, got my start in communist Poland in the 1980s um, as a social anthropologist, continued my work in post-communist Eastern Europe, including Russia and Ukraine in the 1990s and 2000s, and spent much of last year in, in, in Ukraine. Never has this experience been more relevant than it is today. Being in the East under communism, post-communism, and last year has helped me analyze what's going on today in the West. The Trump insurgency was not so unexpected for me. In fact, I had been watching the factors that led to it for the past decade and, and a half as a new breed of shadow or influence elites, as, they, as I call them, has arisen, as people's faith in the system, in public institutions, has plummeted, and as income inequalities have soared at the same time. At least in part as a result of all of this, more and more people have come to see themselves as outsiders as outsiders. So I, today I address these, these questions. Who are the outsiders and why did they come to see themselves as such? Two, why are people turning to figures like Trump? Three, how do Trump and his, his, his opposite numbers actually govern when they, when they come to power? So let's turn to one. Who are the outsiders and how did they, they get to be that way? I began thinking about the rise of the anti-establishment about eight years ago after my 2009 book, Shadow Elite, was published. It was the same year that the Tea Party formed. Um, the Tea Party, a movement on the anti-big government right that harks back to the 1773 original Tea Party. Tea Partiers rallied against what they saw as excessive government spending and taxes and a bailout, importantly a bailout for Wall Street that favored elites and banks. Two and a half years later came a left-wing pro protest movement, the Occupy Wall Street movement. Its followers decried bad behavior on the part of Wall Street banks and growing income inequality. They were the 99 percent doomed to a life of struggle compared to the ultra-rich, super-rich one percent. 
Like the Tea Party, they blasted a bailout for Wall Street that favored elites and big banks. Here we saw conservatives and young leftists voicing the same complaint, even if they didn't agree on anything else. And so four years ago, I began writing in my book, my most recent book, Unaccountable, that people right and left, Tea Partiers and occupiers, even some centrists, were seeing themselves as outsiders. I, write, I wrote that more and more we feel like we're excluded from a system we used to know how to negotiate, but no longer quite do know how to negotiate it. Figuring things out is not as straightforward as in the past, even 25 or five years ago. We sense a division between the outsiders and the insiders, and that the insiders are working on their own behalf even as they purport to have us, the public, in mind. The rest of us are left on the outside, knocking to get in. Fast forward to last year's election. People feeling excluded voted for candidates who pr presented themselves as outsiders, that is, outside the establishment. I was on Trump's email, or one of his email listservs. There was Donald Trump on the right and Bernie Sanders on the left. Trump core supporters are substantially middle-aged, less educated, mostly white men, people who no longer are guaranteed employment, let alone a pension. Sanders supporters, largely young people such as university students saddled with student debt who aren't getting jobs when they graduate and go home to live with their parents, which in the United States hasn't happened since before. World War II, it used to be that if you went home to live with your parents, you were a bona fide loser. Of course, I don't mean to compare Trump and Sanders in temperament, experiment, experience, or character. Sanders never exhibited the authoritarianism that Trump does. While the disaffection of these outsiders may come from radically different places, it appears to arise from the same instinct that the system is rigged against us, and that players institu and institutions at the top are corrupt, and both Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party used that, that, used that language, the language of corruption, and they didn't mean bribery, they didn't mean simple garden variety corruption, they meant that it smells bad, that there is a dealing going on that, um, that, that defies the public interest. Naturally, pundits and academics have been struggling to understand it. Many, many are using the word populism to explain what's going on. But is this the populism of the past? The disaffected are anti-establishment and anti-elitist. They have sometimes trouble identifying precisely who is responsible, and as their anger boils, they're encouraged to see others, like immigrants and Muslims, as dangerous outsiders. But the disaffected are also anti-system. They're anti-system. They want to dismantle the system with little notion of what to replace it with, or, what, or even what that, would, what that would mean. For instance, in the United States, the rush to appeal, repeal, um, Obamacare, which is the, uh, which was uh, um, Obama, President Obama's signature health care uh, insurance for a, a, for a much wider part of American society, they want to They've been rushing to appeal, a repeal Obamacare with nothing firm to replace it. Um, a lot of attention in recent months has focused on this anti-establishment um, anti -establishment element, movements far and wide. Um, foundations, um, governments are trying to understand right-wing populism and what went, went wrong. I was among a handful recently of, invite, uh, of academics invited to participate in a tiny closed workshop um, toward that goal, and I'm, I'm sure many of these same discussions are, are going on here, and many of you have been involved. There's a tendency to focus on those people out there, which makes some sense if it doesn't further ingrain our stereotypes of them. But the elites and technocrats people are railing against 
deserve at least as much scrutiny, I would argue, if we're going to truly grasp these anti-system revolts and where they might lead. There appears to be a close relationship among the ways that elites have been rigging the system in the past uh, you know, couple of decades, the decline in trust in formal institutions and leaders, the surge in economic inequality, the rise of anti-establishment, anti-system movements in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere, and the popularity of figures such as Trump. Let's take a look at each of these themes. First, elite rigging of the system. In addition to working in Eastern Europe since communist times, over the past couple of decades, as Nick said, I've also been studying Western elites who wield power and influence. I've examined how the system has changed and how influence elites operate in new and insidious ways. And the elites, the influence elites I'm talking about, are defined by their, the way that they're organized and their modus operandi, um, rather not by family background or wealth or, in, or institutional position. So strictly by the way that they operate and how they are organized. I document how elites operate and organize themselves um, um, today and how these ways and means have changed in response to seismic changes over the past several decades. So these include the privatization and deregulation which has shaped the very, very, um, the very nature of, of, of government. The dispersion of global authority with the end of the Cold War, which created even more huge numbers of new entities that get involved in policy making from think tanks to NGOs to grassroots organizations um, to business uh, organizations and so on. Financialization, which takes, in which finance takes an outsized role in the economy and in policy making, and digital technology, which now shapes almost everything from making instant uh, complex financial trading possible to nearly destroying the old or the legacy media while at the same time giving influence elites a new medium to brand themselves and their, and their actions. Information has been blasted into a trillion or more pieces and we're served up a handful of those pieces and think that we're getting a full picture on our tiny smart uh, smartphone screens. This has enabled the post-truth society in ways never before conceivable. Any of these changes is weighty, to say the least. But put them all together, which you need to do to understand the forces allowing players to exploit the system in new ways. And it's a lot to process. I've taken it on as an almost full-time job, and it's taken me years to, to, to try to understand it. One key difference is the organization of today's influence elites compared with the power elites described by sociologist C. Wright Mills uh, more than a half century ago. Mills power elite, his pillars of power, describes in this interlocking constellation of government officials, military leaders, and corporate executives who, he, he contended, effectively controlled political and social decision making in the United States. They were, in Mill's analysis, firmly planted in distinct hierarchies and the dominance and stability of the nation state system. That's very important. Today, of course, officials still wield direct power, but now there are far more entities influencing policy in informal ways that are difficult, if not impossible, to track. Players themselves can be pillars of power. And governance has been evolving. So their positions in informal networks and links to organizations and venues that collect elites across, that connect elites across a global plane are today the source of much power and influence. Play, when players themselves are the, the pillars of power, here's what can happen. Try keeping up with, with, with this example. 
A consulting firm in Washington comprised of former regulators is paid top dollar by big banks, big banks that are their clients. They, they use inside government information to help these banks to get around anticipated regulation, so they serve as regulation sleuthers. Um, they lobby their connections in the government informally against regulation. And at the same time, the federal government outsources its regulatory authority at times to re for those consulting for that consulting firm to regulate the same big banks, right? Um, so, so at, at the same time, they are the supposed regulators of the bank that these banks are their 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 clients and and, and so on. So. Um, this means that the court sometimes mandated that the consultants oversee the auditing process of the firm's own clients, big banks, when those banks were accused of wrongdoing also. So they defend them when they, when they, when they, when they go to court. So governance has been evolving, and I've been studying the, the evolution. Um, in the 2000s, I investigated how certain elite groups upended the system as they progressively innovated new means of achieving their ideological, uh, their ideological goals. I wrote about what I call the neocon core, an informal, tight-knit group of a dozen or so players, core players, who helped take the United States to war in Iraq. This power clique had worked with each other in various incarnations for some 30 years to realize their goals, their goals for American foreign policy via the assertion of military power. And it's important to understand them because they have innovated governance, um, new, new techniques in, in, in governing and governance over the past um, 20, 30 years. Um, in the 1970s, the neocon Corps challenged the professional and bureaucratic authority of government by setting up um, an in independent board to contest the CIA's estimates about Soviet power. And they set a precedent for alternative intelligence assessment, assessments, um, which then get, gain official standing. In the 1980s and early 2000s, they pioneered the use of seemingly impartial independent think tanks, of which we've seen um, an explosion. Uh, which were actually controlled by the same interlocking set of people. So if you look on this chart, you see the players are in, are in the center there. Um, and these players, this, this is only one dimension in which these players are, in a, inter, are, connected, are interconnected with, with each other. You see that the same set of people belongs to, um, is involved in these same um, um, six think tanks, five of which they, 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 they set up. Um, and this gives the false impression that the message has depth and, and breadth. And this whole think tank world has, has, has evolved considerably since then. David, David Miller here at the University of Bath is working on think tanks as, in, as is Nick, Nick Pierce. Um, in the early 2000s, after September 11th, they advocated overhauling what they called Byzantine bureaucracy and sharply increasing the number of political employees in, go in, in government as they helped lead the United States to war in Iraq. They specialized in ambiguous consulting arrangements with government so that, for instance, one prominent neocon core member, Richard Pearl, in the center there, who's a, some, some, somewhat of a linchpin of the group, a former government official went around uh, Europe giving speeches to America's allies, leaving the impression that he was a current official, which, which he wasn't. Two neocon group members who doubled as Pentagon officials, officials set up secret Pentagon units manned only with trusted um, friends and ideological allies to produce intelligence showing that Saddam Hussein had weapons of, of mass destruction, supposedly. 
So they personalized the bureaucracy, dealing primarily with members of their set across the bureaucracy, the State Department, and the Vice President's um, office, which is another technique, and marginalizing other officials who should have been included by virtue of their uh, official position. A veteran CIA officer who coordinated the intelligence assessments regarding Iraq told me that, you know, there was no process. That is the respect in which this case is markedly different from anything I've seen in the past. In Iraq, he said, there's this whole machinery that exists um, of interagency meetings and so on, and he had always seen it used in the past. But he said, in Iraq, this machinery never got used. Um, this case is not only important in showing the, the, the innovations in, in governance and, um, and, and, and how the, they have been, all of these have been built on uh, massively since they were first, for, since they were first tried, but, but also uh, it is important in understanding the rise of Trump and Sanders, uh, Sanders both insurgent candidates, both of these insurgent candidates, um, Found, um, um, found a lot of, when, came out against the Iraq war and found a lot of, uh, of support. They came out uh, after the fact and, came, and found a lot of su support for this among the, the populace. Um, uh, and, and, and this was, was certainly something that was, that was discussed in the, in, in the campaign. So I had seen this sort of elite-based power clique before in Eastern Europe, especially in the immediate post-war, post, sorry, post-communist period. Um, and I had watched how these power cliques are pre, uh, pursue their own goals through different administrations, ev even through revolutions. And, and it's the administrations that are serving their goals in the end rather than, rather than them serving a particular uh, ad administration. Um, and I saw how they put their, 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 their people in, in the most powerful places so that their cliques would benefit. They had some in the, in the, in the, in the in national branches of international banks and foundation, foundations. They had them in privatization agencies and so on. And again, the idea was that that they themselves would, would, would benefit rather than the institutions, both governmental and non-governmental institutions, for which their members were working at any given time. So where does that leave um, the, the, the public interest? Well, this was perhaps best expressed by someone close to, to the neocon core who told me there is no conflict of interest because we define the, the interest. And this is the kind of, of elite behavior that, um, that voters, liberal and conservative, were railing, railing, railing against. And little surprise that American populations most affected by the war, which were rural white communities, voted for the supposedly anti-elite uh, Trump. And they have a point, as my work shows, influence elites today in, indeed have gained the system in new and different ways. In my talk here last spring, I detailed how this has occurred in policy decisions from foreign policy to healthcare to the economy. And let me highlight some of the cases that became flashpoints for the anti-system Trump and Sanders voters. The Wall Street bailout, which I examined as a process that defied standards of, of transparency, one aspect was Treasury Secretary and ex-Goldman Sachs chief, Henry Paulson, his choice in personnel. He brought in a banker, supposedly retired from Goldman Sachs, someone he, of course, trusted, who served as his de facto envoy in high-stakes gatherings with failing banks and insurers. But he was technically a contractor, not a government employee, and thus was not required to disclose his financial holdman, uh, holdings, and he was subject to far fewer rules. And on whose behalf was he actually working? Was he representing Goldman Sachs during those meetings that would affect the entire global economy? 
We'll never know since he was accountable to no one other than Paulson. Or in health care, also very controversial in the election. Former Senator Major Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle helped shape President Obama's signature legislation, health care reform, even while he was consulting for health care insurance firms on the very, very same issues. Or the Clinton Foundation, a huge, which, which Donald Trump made a huge issue out of taking donations from um, from, from, from countries and other donors as a kind of potential backdoor campaign cash and donations that would compromise Hillary Clinton should she take the presidency. Um, Trump made this a, a huge issue in the campaign. So citizens already um, had a growing awareness of this kind of rigging and now they are learning more and more about yet another form of rigging that I talked about in my last book, and that would be dark arts. Dark arts sponsored by foreign powers, among other stealth influencers like PR firms, now often using digital tools and often hired PR firms. The PR firms are heavily involved in, 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 this, in this industry. Um, they do Twitter attacks, whitewashing Wikipedia gaming search results, and of course spreading fake news. This past year, while, ba while I was based partly in Ukraine, I saw firsthand how skilled and practiced Putin's Russia is at dark arts, helping to destabilize Europe and, and Eastern Europe more generally. We in the, in the U.S., of course, are still grappling with the scope of Russian interference and what it means about Trump's connections. Personnel choices with Russia ties, several people in his cabinet um, are clearly tied to, to the Russians through, through business, and of course his intentions regarding Russian policy going, going forward. An insidious consequence of these dark arts and new ways of elite, elite operating and organizing is that the public has an information problem. In the, in the information age, the public has an information problem, and it's not only with respect um, to, to, to government. We don't know if Henry Paulson's designated deputy from, from, SAC, uh, from Goldman Sachs had the public interest as his motiv motivating factor um, the influence of these dark arts and players' activities is real, yet practically invisible. We don't know when Tom Daschle, um, the former Senate Majority Leader who worked with Obama on the health care package, when he appears in the media, is he a dis dispassionate expert, or is he promoting a client, or is he simply promoting his brand? We, we can't know that. Hillary Clinton could could never convince voters that her family's foreign donations would not sway her decision making. And when Trump voters received endless coverage of that foundation, they didn't know that its source at the time might actually be a foreign power itself. Talk about talk about irony. When they are organized and operate in ways that are, that are often invisible and make accounta accountability nearly impossible, these players are flirting with or flat out engaging with what I call the new corruption, fully legal actions that nevertheless violate the public trust. This point is often lost on elites, but ordinary people seem to have sensed or many ordinary people seem to have sensed a problem. Now, Trump, it's important to note, has not, until becoming president, been one of these elites shaping policy. He's actually useful in making the distinction about who I am talking about or was talking about anyway. Trump is a wealthy celebrity who, until becoming president, had not been involved in any big way in policy manipulation. But Trump, the likes of Trump, is what happens when elites in the establishment game the system to their advantage, leaving regular people disillusioned and looking for a savior in an authoritarian figure like Trump. So the way elites rig the system, I argue, um, um, 
is related to the corrosion of public trust, my second theme here. As I wrote in my 2014 book, there's been a striking loss of confidence in formal institutions, whether it's governments and parliaments and courts or banks or the media. And this is not only in the United States and in, in, in Europe, even in places like, like Sweden, but it, it's, it's actually quite, um, it, it's on a much larger scale. Um, the PR firm Edelman measures trust and in January released some of the most dire findings I've seen calling the situation worldwide an implosion of trust with a full two-thirds of the countries measured deemed distrusters with less than half of its people trusting in mainstream institutions. Interestingly, um, I think the, the only institution or among the only institutions across the board that, that, has, that has not declined in public trust and in some places even gained is the military. In Western democracies where people used to have much more faith in the system, people blame institutions, leaders, elites. Of course, as we know, unfortunately, some are also blaming the most vulnerable among them, like immigrants. As I've said, the idea of a rigged system exploded in the United States as early as 2009 with the Tea Party. Um, but the belief that key institutions were no longer responsive to regular people and their needs was no doubt percolating for years. And if you think about this, some of it, 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 it sort of makes sense. If you think about, for instance, a bank and what you able, were, used to be able to get from your local bank in a Western democracy and what it looks like now. Um, very briefly, I've, I tracked, uh, in, in several cases, solving a problem, getting my mortgage, um, uh, getting a mortgage and getting my credit resolved um, that had been damaged due to an, uh, an, an actual credit card uh, payment that had that had been made, but uh, but I was being uh, I was in the system for for actually it not having been made, and it was for thirteen dollars and twenty six cents anyway. Um, but the point is that I used to be able to go into my local my local banker. I even tried this at one point after being you know on the phone with fifty different people in different places and spending many hours trying to resolve the problem. Going into a local Bank of America and trying to get the, 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 the problem fixed. What could they do? Anybody know? The only thing they could do is what I could do, which is get on the phone and call into the phone tree. So, so they have much less, at the local level has much less autonomy, in, 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 and I'm talking about just not just government, but corporate institutions as well in many arenas that it used to have, and, and that may well be um, one of the reasons for, for this, this lack of trust. Institutions are able to deliver less than, than, than they used to at the, at the local level. And as I learned in Eastern Euro Europe during those years of, of communism, societies schooled in communism are accustomed to not trusting the system and its, former instit and, and its formal institutions. But that's not the case in the West where many people genuinely believed in civic institutions 20, 30, 40 years ago. But today, by contrast, many people sense that they no longer have a voice. They perceive that elites are gaming the system and that they can no longer hold policymakers to account. Now, the third theme here that's related is, is inequality. Elite rigging of the system has helped, bringing, has helped to bring about surging income inequality over the past several decades and contributed to the public's decline in trust in formal institutions. Of course, many factors, which will be debated for years, appear to be at play in the surge of inequality. Globalization and free trade, technological displacement are among um, those most, most often um, cited. But new models of operating and organizing influence of the, by the elites have surely contributed as well. 
American political scientist Jeffrey Winters, author of the book Oligarchy, said that the US data on stratification makes us look worse than ancient Rome. And a study a few years back by political scientists Gillens and Page found that 1,800 policy decisions that they looked at hewed closely to the preferences of people in the 90th percentage of income. Individual actions by top firms show that rigging characteristics contributed to inequality. Most broadly, the invention of exotic derivatives served to enrich Wall Street banks and their wealthiest clients. Average investor, investors had little, had little access to this. Uh, in the years leading up to the 2008 financial crisis, for instance, Goldman Sachs created deals like the Abacus case in which the bank sold investments it knew were bad to one client, like pension funds, at the behest of other more powerful clients. Some of those bad investments were sold to pension. Um, some of the bad investments were, show, were sold to pension funds. And, and, and this is the financial collapse. So will the US go the way of Rome? Sociologist Jack Goldstone's work on revolutions shows that while in the short term, in the short term, elites can get away with vast inequalities, this cannot be sustained over the long term. Was election day in the United States this past fall a revolution? Judging by Trump's early actions, those vast inequalities will only grow ever larger, and it's a painful irony to contemplate. This brings us to point two. Why are people turning to figures like Trump? In the wake of failed wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a rash of terrorism attacks and the 2008 financial collapse, Americans feeling helpless seem to seek a strong man. Um, many flock to Trump's message of power and reclaiming glory times. Um, Trump exploits nostalgic yearning, nationalism, and finds convenient scapegoats in vulnerable people like immigrants. So do other leaders who share some of the same characteristics, like Yaroslav Kaczynski, um, um, the head of Poland's governing party, and Viktor Orban, Hungary's prime minister. They all share this, this, this trait. These three, la three leaders, too, um, attacked elite, they all attacked elite corruption with a vengeance during their campaigns. That was a huge issue. Trump constantly talked about draining the swamp of, of corruption, draining the Washington swamp. But as with any charismatic, charismatic figure, much comes down to the qualities of the man himself and the cultural divide that he capitalizes on. The appeal of Trump and others like him lies in a shared anti-system outsider stance. Um, Orban in Hungary disparages what he calls the liberal Buda Budapest elite. Kaczynski in Poland disparages liberal cosmopolitan, cosmopolitans. The key to understanding how Trump connects with voters is that despite his money, his inherited money, that is, he seems to see himself as one of them, as an outsider. He comes, for instance, from, from, from Queens, a borough of New York City, um, and he's never been accepted by the, by the, the Manhattan um, money set. So he lives and breathes grievance, as, a, as absurd as that might sound when discussing a, a real estate um, air. At the same time, it appears that many in America view him as a virtual family member, a straight-talking authoritative one, which stems from more than a decade behind the chair on a reality TV show, The Apprentice. Some analysts have argued compellingly that years on the program and the way is the set looked allowed people to view him as presidential. But at the same time, it made people feel like Trump was an authentic part of their lives. 
as I've written, the creation of fake or faux authenticity and simulacra, things that that seem like something else but are not, is a tool of influence, one that's grown ever more powerful um, with the explosion of, of social media. All three leaders, um, Trump, Kaczynski, Orban, have fomented this polarization of society that's, that's about 50-50 in, 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 in these places, and the conflict I think it's important to understand is not only political. They have tapped into the divide of Weltanschauung, of worldview, culture, style, information, facts, and association. Those on one side of the divide don't invite those on the other to the dinner table. This divide is made ever more complete with and complex with the help of computer algorithms and social media in which, for instance, the Trump and the Clinton voter were served up media that would barely register as real to each other. Um, so that the algorithm offers starkly different memes, music, films, and con consumer products. If you look, for instance, at Breitbart News, which is um, where Steve Bannon, Trump's a key advisor and right-hand man uh, came from. If you compare that with, with, with the New York Times, well, there's no comparison, and I don't mean the coverage of the same issue. I mean that the issues that are being highlighted and covered in one are often not at all even appearing in, in the other. That's how stark the, 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 the divide is. So in Trump voters and Orban and Kaczynski supporters feel excluded and demeaned culturally, not just politically. Finally, the appeal of Trump lies too in the breaking of taboos. He breaks taboos both in what he or his circles say. So refugees are like Skittles, like candies. And also in how he says it. Core, though not all Trump supporters, view this as a reason to support him, not as something to put aside because of Trump's other supposed virtues. So it actually attracts people to Trump. Mary Douglas, the anthropological giant who wrote Purity and Danger, might argue as writes Tanya Lerman, a contemporary anthropologist, that Trump's appeal has something to do not only with political anger, but also with the religious imagination. The qualities that make him seem subhuman to some, his willingness to flout all codes of respectful behavior, make him superhuman to others. That transcendent quality might also explain why the facts do not seem to matter much to his followers. We are in the domain of faith, not that of reason. Trump gives them hope and something else. It's a rare moment of empowerment. As Lorman points out, the politics of hatred and those of hope can be closely linked. Now let's move to my final point, point three. How do Trump and his, his contemporaries actually govern when they come to power. And what I offer today are, are some points for discussion because Trump has only been in power for two months, although his counterparts in Poland and especially Hungary have a, have a, longer, have a longer legacy. All three leaders have been reshaping the institutional systems and reorganizing governance to, to consolidate um, their power. With all three, power, personality, and politics, Trump democratic process. One way that Trump in particular is increasing power is through the use of executive orders. Now, executive power was already on the rise when I wrote about it eight years ago. President Obama continued um, that, that trend towards increased executive 
signing statements and executive orders, but Trump is presidential power on steroids. And in less than 100 days, the new president has made considerable um, headway in the dismantling of government structures. He's fulfilled his campaign promise by, by appointing mostly outsiders to government, people with no government uh, public experience whatsoever. But many of his appointees have direct ties to the industries that they would now be expected to, to, to regulate. So he's, 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 he's filling the swamp um, with billionaires and, and bankers. Several have been, several of his appointees have been put in charge of agencies or advising agencies that they have explicitly stated in the past they wanted to largely abolish, especially in the areas of, of energy and um, environmental um, regulation. Um, so just yesterday there was, there was a, a directive that promises a gutting of essentially a federal of a federal government that has not been seen since the end of um, World War II. And it's, it's scary but interesting to contemplate what, what, what that will mean. So um, anything that smacks of, of regulation um, is, is on the chopping block. But, but in terms of personnel, um, I imagine that many of the soon-to-be unemployed government experts who, let's say, have been on the regulatory side, will now be seeking jobs in industry and now working on behalf of it, because where are they supposed to go for employment, right? And that's, that's, that's what's been happening in the media. So, that, so, that, so, so um, the number of journalists has declined. The uh, number of investigative reporters in particular is reclined, has declined dramatically over the, over the past Number, number of years, and where do unemployed journalists go? Well, where they can go, which is often to, to the other side. They're on the other side of the, of the, of the um, working for companies, working for think tanks that have an agenda and so on. Now, when Trump can't dismantle um, the government, uh, he builds on his shadow or his influence elite press predecessors by doing some of the things that I, that, I, that I mentioned earlier that the neocon core, for instance, was engaged in, by sidelining or subverting or reorganizing bureaucracy to his liking and devaluing expertise. Checks and balances and expertise are being sacrificed to give power to the president and his tiny circle of trusted devotees. So, for instance, um, Trump has reorganized the National Security Council to include his political advisor, Steve Bann, and the one from, from Breitbart News, who has no expertise or background in national security, um, and at, at the same time excluding the director of national intelligence and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who are right, required by law to be members of the Principals Committee of the National Security Council. In his first uh, weeks in office, he issued an enormously disruptive and confusing executive order that you've heard about. Uh, the travel ban that excluded citizens of several majority uh, Muslim countries, he did this without informing the relevant bureaucratic players and agencies, which created a chaos at airports um, around the world. All three leaders, Trump, Kaczynski, Orban, have sought to consolidate their power, and all have, have um, sought to do that in, in one way through eliminating or reshaping public broadcasting. So Trump would like to eliminate uh, funding for it altogether. Um, Poland's um, law, and party just, law and Justice Party under Kaczynski, pushed through a law to allow swift replacing of, of public broadcasting early on. And in Hungary, Orban created a new media council, um, which was empowered not just, just to choose public broadcasting management, to all, but also to find outlets, if, to find outlets if they don't uphold public morality. Um, the council also sought to limit political advertising in ways to drown out, that would drown out opposition, opposition voices. Um, all three leaders seek to curtail the power of the courts. 
Um, Poland and Hungary both have tampered with the judiciary's independence, both engaging in court packing, that is, um, attempts to override checks and balances by nominating many members of his or her own party to the, to the high court. In addition, Hungary appointed a so-called judicial czar who has the power to decide where cases are heard and by whom. All three leaders surround themselves with loyalists who wield um, informal power. Trump has chosen family members as official and unofficial um, um, advisors. In reorganizing governance through information and politicization of the bureaucracy, in sidelining expertise and increasing executive authority, all to concentrate power at the top, Trump is not only building on, but taking to unprecedented heights and blatancy, indeed sometimes exploding, the modus operandi perfected by the shadow, the previous shadow, and influence elites. And this is, of course, what the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street um, all believed was, was, was corrupt. Trump has been not only attacking the structures of, um, and processes of democratic government, but he has been assaulting the norms that underpin all liberal democracies, notably the pillars of independent media and judiciary. These include calling the independent media the opposition party just a week after his inauguration. And his right-hand man, Steve Bannon, stated that the media should keep its mouth shut and listen for a while. Orban in Hungary, for his part, stated in 2014 that he believes in creating a, quote, illiberal state looking to Russia, China, and Turkey as, um, as examples. More broadly, Trump's style itself is having an incredibly destabilizing, incredibly destabilizing effect Though even the word style is problematic because it is, suggests some um, consistency. The neocon core's creation of alternative intelligence in the 2000s now looks like child's play. Trump has exploded this into um, all out alternative facts, probably heard that expression, brazenly stating falsehood after falsehood, ranging from the laughingly minor, whether the sun was shining on his inauguration day, it was not, to the serious, whether his predecessor spied on him, no evidence to support this. And of course, he's gone to war with the intelligence community as revelations about his team's connections with Russia keep dripping out. His first speech to a joint session of Congress just a couple of weeks ago was notable for its more positive tone and his uncharacteristic ability to stick to a script, but stick to a script. But just days later, talk about inconsistency, he accused former President Obama of a serious crime in yet an, another early morning Twitter rant, once again an unprecedented breach of norms and decorum. People I talk about in the bureau talk with in the inside the bureaucracy are running in circles, in many cases on hold, or in in other cases, intelligence analysts were told to develop and deliver an overarching detailed anti-terrorism strategy within 30 days. Now, is Trump's chaotic and un unpredictable style by design, or is it just incompetence? We might ask. This way of operating feels authoritarian and reminiscent to me of martial law, Poland in the, in the 80s. When new measures and practices are handed down every day and everyone is kept off guard, is this not an effective way of controlling people? And is it a deliberate strategy, as, as Trump has been doing, to make very provocative media attracting statements so the media focuses on them at the same time that he is, for instance, reorganizing the National Security Council. The, the Muslim ban, the first Muslim ban, happened during the same time that he was doing this insidious reorganization. <laughs> there is always a play of interest in democracy. And there have always been periods, at least in the United States, when parts of government were deemed worthy of dismantling. But today's dismantling is being pushed through without 
the previous backdrop of stabilization. Everything seems to be up for grabs, even the truth. And with intense polarization among the citizen, citizenry, it's dismantling piece by piece those foundations of society that, that up till now um, this world order has regarded as solid and unquestionable, as indisputable. And it's being pushed through by leaders who openly attacked, attack norms that underpin liberal democracy. Dystopian fiction has been hugely popular for about a decade. And it was often said that these books describe not a distant, broken world of the future, but the one we live in now. Indeed, dystopia appears to be in present tense in the free world. So in conclusion, a question um, and some food for thought. What does this dystopian age, an age when power seems to trump policy and process, what does this all mean for public policy and the teaching and the practice of public policy? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.